So it's my privilege today to introduce to you Trevor Lewington. Uh, Trevor is the mayor of Stirling um, and he's in his third term on council, second term as mayor, and has been instrumental in Stirling's journey to net zero. Um, Trevor is also the Chief Executive Officer for the Economic Development uh, Lethbridge. Please welcome Trevor. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, fantastic to be here with you. I appreciate the invite back. I spoke back in 2019, and it's always nice when you get another invite back that says you weren't so bad the first time around that it was okay to bring you back. Uh, great to be here to tell you a little bit about our journey uh, in Sterling. So 20 minutes to the south and east of the city, of course, if you take Highway 4 towards the Coots border crossing. A couple of things you might not know is that Sterling is one of just three communities in Canada that are, is designated as a national historic site. So Quebec City and Lunenburg, Nova Scotia are the other two. So Sterling is one of those three. We are also the largest uh, village in Alberta by population. So we have just under 1,300 people. So largest population uh, of a village in Alberta by, by those numbers. And you know we're very, very proud of our past, of course, being a historic site, that's an important part of our who we are. But we're also preparing for the future. So we were fortunate enough to land a, a partnership with Axia at the time and deployed fiber optic cable throughout our community. And so just about 90% of the homes in Sterling actually have access to gig fiber. So my joke was always I could get better fiber at home in rural Alberta than I could get in my office in downtown Lethbridge, which was a bit of a problem. Uh, but you know, fortunately, other, other technologies are catching up. But again, I think it speaks to this planning forward, making sure you're thinking about the future of your community. And we're, we're thrilled to be a family-centered community. It is very much a, a safe place to call home. It's where community still matters, and that's you know, sort of how we define ourselves. You know, our vision is really this idea around sustainable growth, and that's really where this idea for solar came from. And the picture that you can see on the side of the slide there is actually our ground mount array. So there's 456 panels there on just under an acre of sort of land space. And that powers all of our street lights, our sewerage lift station, uh, anything that's not attached to a building. So we have a number of rooftop arrays that are on buildings like our community center and our fire hall, but anything else where we can't put a panel on the top of the building, we aggregate all of that use into this ground mount. And so this sort of covers off all of the rest. But for us, it was about sustainable growth. It was how do we future-proof our community? How does rural Alberta survive? It's things like this as we plan for the future. And the picture in this particular slide is actually the school. So the Sterling School was modernized in 2019. They went through about a $15 million uh, modernization and expansion. Not a lot had been spent on the school since the 50s and 60s. So it was great to see this facility expanded. But as a part of the modernization efforts, Alberta Education now does this on every school in the province. So when a school is modernized and brought up to modern standards, they do add solar generation to the rooftops as well. And so, you know, the school's not part of the municipality. It's a separate, of course, building, se separate jurisdiction, but it's again part of very much of what we're doing. And so it's this idea that's on the slide around, we're proud of our ha past, we have a rich heritage, but we're taking ownership of our future because the only way we're gonna be successful in the future is if we own that and we drive that as a community. So the school is very much central to that, of course. Council's strategy is really built around these three pillars. I'm not a complicated person. I like things simple and I can only count to three. So that's why there's only three pillars to our strategy. And it's really around build community, celebrate community, and grow community. It's really those three things, right? So when we talk about build community, we're improving infrastructure, we're providing amenities to our community. What does that look like? Celebrate community is getting people involved, sharing pride in our community, and then that last piece is around development and economy. And net zero, in my mind, speaks to all three of these things. And I would love to tell you that this was all inspired by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Many of you are probably aware of the SDGs around sustainability. I would love to say that the whole reason we decided to look at solar was because we wanted to lower our carbon footprint. That we were driven by this you know, compelling notion of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I could tell you that, but I would be lying. That actually had nothing to do with our decision-making process. 
I would also like to tell you that in the pre-Greta era, you know, of 2018, 2017, when we were looking at this project, that the climate and the planet was foremost on our minds. And again, that would be a lie. I'm not suggesting those things aren't important, but it was not the initial reason that we started exploring these technologies and seeking to understand whether it was a fit for our community. What really drove it was the fact that 97% of our tax base is residential. We have very limited commercial land. We have very limited scope for growth in our tax base. So every decision that council makes directly affects the residential taxpayer. Now that is also true in Lethbridge, as you're all experiencing with the recent budget, right? But in, in Sterling, it's much more amplified. It's much more direct because the, the tax base is all residential. So any spending decision is directly attributable to the taxpayer. It's why we've done a lot of work over the last number of years finding efficiencies and avoiding tax increases because we know the impact that has on residents. And so if you think back to 2017, the government of the day implemented a price cap on the price of electricity. It's 6.8 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, to be fair, there's no such thing as a price cap. It was actually a tax subsidy. That tax subsidy cost taxpayers in excess of $700 million. But at the time, 6.8 was seen as the upper limit. What's the current price cap that the current government has implemented? 13 and a half cents. Now, it's also not a price cap. It's actually a deferral program. It's a loan you pay back in the future, so it's not a price cap either. But back in 2017, the forward-looking forecast said our power bill was going to double. At the time, we were paying probably around six cents, and the forecast said we could expect to pay 12 or 13 cents by today. And lo and behold, that's where we're at now. The regulated rate in Alberta for January, depending on your provider, is somewhere between 26 and 29 cents today. Six cents seems like a dream, but it was not that long ago. So we're looking forward thinking, oh my goodness, how are we going to protect our taxpayers? How are we going to avoid this cost and have our electrical bill for our community potentially triple? That's not something we can absorb. That would be a cost we have to pass on to the taxpayer. How do we avoid that? And so solar was a key part of that strategy. And so what really drove the decision was the dollars. So in 2017, before we had solar, our municipal power bill was $31,172. So to power streetlights, our community center, all of our other buildings, based on the 6.1 cents we were paying at that time, our power bill was $31,000. So fast forward to today, you could probably triple that number. But in fact, last year, our power bill was in fact a total credit of almost $7,300. Right? So we took an expense paying for electricity, which most of you have probably lived in Alberta most of your lives. You get that that's an important consideration to live here. We took that expense of 30 some thousand dollars a year and we now net generate revenue from what used to be an expense. So that $40,000 pays for the fine looking folks that you see in the center, which is our volunteer fire department. Right? Fire is inordinately expensive. It's one of the most expensive aspects of running a municipality. I'm blessed to have these 30 or so individuals that do it for free. We pay them not one penny, but we like to invest in equipment and tools that help them do their jobs. $40,000 in a community of our size is a massive difference in our operating budget and a massive difference to an investment we can make in our fire department. So that's what drove the behavior. I'm not saying greenhouse gas emissions aren't important. I'm not saying that our carbon footprint and reducing that isn't important, but it didn't drive the initial decision. Those are all benefits, certainly. We can quantify those. Our solar panels, for example, are the rough equivalent of taking 41 cars off the road. Not earth shattering, but it's 41 less cars or the equivalent thereof that are not spewing emissions into the air. But it was really this idea of how do we take a cost and generate revenue that drove our process. 
So I do have a handout if you're interested. I have a bunch of them with me that explains a lot of this in sort of a paragraph form. But we have a number of rooftop installations. So our public workshop, our Lions Hall, which is our community center. We have an FCSS building in our fire hall. We have a number of small micro-generation rooftop units there. And then, like I said, everything else we push through our two ground mount installations. And how solar net billing works, in case you're not familiar, the solar panels on our roofs and on those ground mounts convert solar energy, which is free. That's the beautiful thing about this process. And it converts it into usable energy through an inverter that we consume on site. So everything we generate is first used in the building on which it's installed, or in the case of the ground mount, that's attached to our sewer lift station. So we use the power first on site, and when we're producing more than we can consume, we export that to the grid. So that's when we make money, we sell our electricity back to the grid, which all of you as users then take. So please keep, keep, keep your lights on. Uh, every time you use energy, we're, we're more than happy to supply it to you. I'm kidding, don't do that, conserve. Um, but it, it's an interesting process, right? Because uh, you know when you're, you, you can forecast your use, you understand weather patterns, there's variation. But over the whole course of a year, we generate more than we can consume. So we know net, we're net zero in that we produce more electricity than we use on average over the course of the whole year. Certainly the last few weeks, that has not been the case. <laughs> we are definitely importing more power for the grid and paying for that. But in the summer, we generate and sell way more power than we can consume. So that was the first step in our journey. And then we realized that there was more money to be made. And so if you're familiar with companies like NMAX or EPCOR, they're municipally controlled corporations, right? They are large electrical and natural gas service providers in the province that are owned by the city of Edmonton and the city of Calgary. So we thought, well, why don't we do that? So we're working with a company called UtilityNet, which is based in Calgary. They have about 23 energy marketers across the province, and we're one of them. So we created an, a municipally controlled corporation. The village of Sterling is the only shareholder called Ridge Utilities, ridgeutilities.net in case you're interested. We sell electricity, natural gas, and internet. And because Alberta is a deregulated market, we can sell to any Albertan. So we have customers in Edmonton. We just uh, are working out a, a marketing associate partnership with the county of Paint Earth up around the Stetler area. So we're expanding our reach and our revenue potential across all of Alberta. Part of what attracted us to this model is a product they call the Solar Club, which allows us to optimize what we sell our power for. So during the summer, when we're exporting more than we can consume, we can actually move our price point up. So we get about 28 cents per kilowatt hour in revenue. And then in the winter time, when we're using more than we can sell, we drop our rates back down. So that price arbitrage, our ability to make the most of what the market is doing, allows us to maximize our revenue. Use. Town of Raymond, you may know, has a number of solar arrays similar to ours. They're also a net zero electrically community. They're a member of our solar club. They're a customer of Ridge Utilities because they can do the same thing. So here's a small community. We own this electrical utility. We're serving Albertans. And at the same time, we're generating non-tax related revenues to our community, right? So that's a good news story. And part of our, our motivation for this was not only a source of revenue for our municipality, but also our ability to reinvest back. So we just sponsored a South Grove scholarship. South Grove this year offered three scholarships. One of those was the Ridge Utilities agri -Food Futures Scholarship. So again, our customers broadly across the South Grove region, which is most of Southern Alberta, benefit from that reinvestment. And we have got all kinds of great ideas as we make more and money, what we can reinvest back in. You can also monetize carbon offsets. So because solar panels are generating electricity that's not a source of carbon, there is a market to trade the offsets that you get for the power. And so uh, we, we use a company called Radical Balance as well as another company called Solar Offset. So there's a lesson in marketing for you. If your product is Solar Offset, call your company that. It's very easy to find. But they help people monetize the credits from their system and help add that. So for most people, it would be another two cents per kilowatt hour in revenue. So think about that, right? You're paying somewhere between 13 plus cents per kilowatt hour. During the summer on the solar club rate, I'm getting paid 28 plus another two cents. I'm capturing 30 cents per kilowatt hour versus your 13 that you're paying. 
So again, there's ways of doing that. And many of these companies, as well as some of the developers, will actually finance the development of solar by monetizing the credits. They'll keep the credits until your system is paid off, so there's actually very little cash out of your pocket. There's a number of different ways to structure that. We're also working on energy efficiency. We still have an obligation to do that. So the top picture there is the Sterling uh, Pool. It's a lovely outdoor facility. It's the most popular place in the summer. But I'm an elected politician responsible for managing the budget. And so I would be far better off to take bundles of money, light them on fire, and drop them in a barrel. Right, as most of you know, recreation facilities lose money. They're not good things from a budget perspective, but they're really important to your community. So, you know, we've been figuring out how do we change that narrative? The pool will probably always lose money. No one wants to pay $37 to get in. Right? That, that break-even point doesn't make any sense, right? If there's any takers, let me know. I'm happy to sell you a special pass. <laughs> um, but what we've been looking at is how do we leverage some other technologies? So there is this thing called solar preheating of water. So you can actually run the water through panels that are going to be mounted on our roof that will preheat the water. Now I don't need the same number or the size of boilers that I had before. And that's the middle picture. We replaced a gigantic, ugly 1970s era boiler that was about 60% efficient with these three modular units that are almost 97, 98% efficient. And the three of them fire in sequence, so depending on how much heat you need, the first one goes and only calls for the second unit and, or the third unit when it's needed. So we think so far, based on our first summer with this system, we've cut our natural gas bill in half. Again, that's a massive difference in expense for us, but it's also good for the environment in the sense that that's half the natural gas we're not burning that we were before. LED lighting is also in the picture there. So again, there's small incremental changes that we can make that make sense, right? They have a payback, there's a, there's an, there's a return on investment. Those are things you should do anyway. They also just happen to be good for the environment. So we're continuing to focus on those things. So that's what we've done so far. That's been our journey to get to this electrically net zero. We know there's a lot more things we could be doing. And so, you know, here are some of the things we're working on next. Uh, one of them is EV chargers. So you may be aware of the Peaks to Prairies EV charging network. There are a series of chargers from Calgary South all along Highway 3 that are a part of this network. And so we're actually adding EV chargers in our community as well. Now, in the Q&A portion, we can debate the politics around electrical vehicles if you really want to. Because there's lots of trade-offs, there's lots of goods, there's lots of bad. But to me, the point is, there is a government mandate. There will be a transition, whether it takes 5, 10, 50 years, we will see more electric vehicles on the road. So that's a fact. If our community is going to attract tourists or is going to be a convenient stop at the gas station along Highway 4, which is the only 24-7 corridor in and out of the province, the only commercial crossing in and out of Alberta, then we should probably have a few EV chargers in our community to be future-proofed, right? There happens to be government funding at the moment, government grant dollars, so it didn't cost us any dollars out of pocket. I recognize it's all the same taxpayer pocket. It's got to come from somewhere. But for our municipality, it's a way to future-proof our community, make sure we have the right infrastructure to attract people, and at the same time, it's a revenue source, because when you come to charge your EV, guess who you're buying your power from? <laughs> Still me, right? Uh, we've also passed a clean energy improvement bylaw in Sterling. Uh, the city of Lethbridge has as well. So we'll actually, both, both of our communities will be in the next cohort for this program. And what it allows you to do is to finance energy efficiency improvements at your home through your property taxes. So if you needed to replace an ancient you know, hot water heater and move to an electric on-demand heater, for example, if you needed to replace windows with much more air efficient triple pane, if you actually wanted to add solar to your home, this SEEP bylaw, as it's known, CEIP, is a cost-effective way of accessing um, relatively cheap financing that's backstopped through your property taxes. That's actually how you pay it back. So the city finances it. Um, and when you sell your home, that debt actually stays with the property. Right? So the debt obligation, because it's tied to your property taxes and your property, it's, and it should because the benefit is still attached to your house. 
you don't have to worry about that transitioning with you. So there are a number of communities in Alberta that are already active in the program. Like I said, Sterling and Lethbridge will be in the next wave sometime this spring, we hope. But it's another way of encouraging people to look at this. Uh, We've seen probably a half dozen or so solar rooftop deployments in our communities since we did our project. So it has inspired a few people. I think the solar club rate and that price arbitrage helps the math on that. But this is another way of making that accessible to people. So good for the environment, but also good for the municipality because we do collect a little bit of interest between what the market interest rate is and what we charge the person who's doing the borrowing. There, there is a bit of margin there, it's not huge, but again, we need to make sure that it actually pays back for our community. But that's another thing that we'll be seeing very, very soon. Uh, LED lighting, right? So we can retrofit buildings. As we, as we upgrade technologies, we should do that. We have a niche need for irrigation, for example, so I literally at one point went through every single power bill for every single meter in our community. That was a fun week, let me tell you. <laughs> but what I learned is we have a series of soccer fields that the irrigation system that's powered is powered by its own meter and it used in a year a dollar seventy-two in electricity. But the bill for that soccer field over the course of a year was over $1,000 in transmission and distribution and admin charges for $2 worth of power. I'd be better off to go down there every day they're doing irrigation and use a hand crank. Like I would volunteer to save a thousand bucks. So is there a solar option? Is there a battery powered option? If I don't have to connect to the grid, is there a way for us to save money on that, that very niche specific application, right? We're going to be replacing things as they burn out. That's called life cycle replacement. So when we do that, is energy efficiency, is that ability to shift away uh, the right thing to do? Like I said, we put natural gas boilers back in at the pool. We didn't go to electrical because the most efficient option for our pool was natural gas. So it doesn't mean everything's going to be electric, but because we have solar, there's an opportunity for us to do that. We also, as a very small community, are risk averse. We need to lag, not lead. Right? So there's all kinds of great technologies out there. There's all kinds of interesting ideas. I would love somebody else to try them first. I will happily go second every single time because I need to know that it works. I don't have the ability to do you know, research and, and development of those ideas. I would much rather just rob and duplicate. That's far easier, right? Uh, we also have an opportunity to build some brand. So the Sterling Wind Project is going ahead north of us. Uh, there are 23 turbines that are going up just five kilometers north of the village. Nothing to do with Sterling. They just happen to call it the Sterling Wind Project. Beautiful. So every time an investor goes to their portfolio or their web page, it looks like we're a part of that. Fantastic. They're also using local contractors and they fill up their trucks at our local gas station. And you know, we hope to build a partnership with them over time. We've talked about how do they invest in our community. But a wind project that happens to be located next door is not such a bad story when you're a net zero electrically community. And how do we tie our brands together? And if they're gonna be promoting their project and they call themselves the Sterling Wind Project, fantastic, you're, you're promoting my community for free, love it. So how do we build stronger relationships with them? Uh, Milk River is working on an EV handy bus. So many communities in Southern Alberta have a small handy bus. Many, many times they provide trips into Lethbridge, for example, for medical appointments and other things. Uh, Milk River is experimenting with this. It's entirely grant funded at this point, and the Peaks to Prairies network has offered them power to charge it for free for the next six years. It's ridiculously expensive by comparison to a standard internal combustion engine, but it's an interesting pilot. And for me, I would love Sterling to be a stop on the, right, the route as they head back to Lethbridge, right? So there's an opportunity for us to be a part of this, but also testing, is there demand for rural transit? Most people who live in Sterling know they need a car because there's no other way to get wherever they need to go. But you know, does rural transit have a place to go? So that, that'll be an interesting thing for us to experiment with as well. And that is me in 25 minutes or less. Um, my contact information is on the screen. I look forward to answering your questions. And like I said, I do have a couple of handouts. If, you, if you'd like a bit of a summary of everything I've said, I do have that for you as well. But I really appreciate the time and the opportunity to be here with you. Just a quick announcement of our next week's speaker. It will be another mayor, only he's a former one, former um, Chris 
um, former Mayor Chris Spearman, and he's going to be speaking on working with Alberta finances as a mayor. Um, and now we're ready for our questions and answers. I'd ask that you please line up uh, the wall, against the wall. Please state your name and a very brief introduction if you have one. And um, if you want to write out a question for Trevor, I can certainly ask it of him. Right. Trevor? Yeah, Maria, of course, has to be first. <laughs> Lay it on me. I'm quick. I'm quick. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Trevor. Great presentation, and I'm really proud of what you've done uh, in Sterling, and I hope that the community is too. I'm Maria Fitzpatrick, and uh, my question to you, uh, and it was triggered by your comment about the $2 bill for irrigation and the $1,000 bill for tr uh, uh, distribution and uh, transmission. So uh, that is an issue because when I look at my bill, my bill's not very high, but the transmission and distribution costs are enormous. So if I go solar, um, the city won't respond if, or my insurance won't cover uh, my house if I go totally solar and uh, regenerate. So what do you do about insurance? Because I want to stay, like if I need, if I have a fire, I need the fire department to come. But if I go totally solar, uh, my insurance coverage won't cover. So when you say totally solar, you mean like disconnected from the grid? Dis off disconnected off from the grid, okay. yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's an important clarification. So um, in, Al in Alberta, most solar is done through the microgeneration regulation, which means you are grid tied. Right, you, you want the ability to be able to pull power from the grid when it's really cold and miserable and there's no sunshine for weeks on end, although it's not as bad as Edmonton. Um, so to go completely off the grid and disconnect, you're right. Insurance is very concerned about that because what if you don't have enough solar to keep your heat going and those kinds of things. I don't know of any insurance company that would not insure a standard micro generation installation. And the reason for that is every installation that's done in a grid tied situation must meet electrical code standards. It has to be permitted and inspected. So there's there's really no issue there. And if, you, if there is an insurance company that won't support it that's not an insurance company I would do business with frankly but you're right completely off the grid completely disconnected in a very remote situation there are other challenges because insurance companies are concerned about the fact typically if you have no power what are you going to do yeah. and if you're not grid tied you don't have the same safeties and interlocks that you do when you're connected to the system but then you're still stuck with paying distribution and... Uh, uh Absolutely. Now, I, I will tell you that, you know, a portion of your transmission and distribution is fixed, meaning you pay for it whether you use any power or not, yeah. and a chunk of it is variable. So the more solar you have, when you're not pulling from the grid and you're using your solar energy, you're not, you're not paying for that variable portion of your transmission and distribution. So you can shrink it, but the fixed charges that are regulated, that are set, they are what they are. Thank you. Great question. Hi, Trevor. Hello. Uh, Henning Mundel is my name. Yeah, what an exciting presentation, especially since Bev and I and family lived in Sterling for 11 years with our uh, kids in the uh, 80s, mainly. Um, and now, for the last, we're in the 10th year of having uh, solar, uh, that our first year we produced 90% and then we, of our use and uh, then we adjusted and now we're producing about 108% of our annual needs. On top of that, we have an electric car, so that would come in handy. And I'm not gonna read a lot of stuff, so don't worry here, but I have a very different kind of question, but relates to you as uh, Mayor of Sterling. Here I have a 19, uh, 2018 article of Town of Raymond Net Zero from the Herald. And then I realized you're a village and they're a town. So then I read up a bit, okay. Uh, you can be a town once you reach a thousand, you're at 1200. Why is Sterling not applied for a town and what would be the advantage? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> 
Yeah, that's that's a great question. Not solar related, but you know, it's a good question. Um, so, in in Alberta, the threshold for becoming a town is one thousand people. If you have a sustained population of more than a thousand people, you can declare yourself a town. And the town of Nobleford did just that. So, when they send, celebrated their centennial, and don't quote the year, but in the last couple of years, they decided to move from village to town. There is actually no advantage whatsoever financially. So village versus town means nothing for grants. It means nothing for your tax powers. As a municipality, there's no change to your status. The town of Nobleford's approach, their, their thought process was people see the word town and it's, it sounds bigger, it sounds more exciting, and they actually did see a boost in investment. They had more residents and more businesses coming to Nobleford because this idea of what a town is actually worked in their favor. Uh, we've had the same discussion in Sterling, but if we're a safe, family-focused, country lifestyle sort of community, we like the idea of staying as a village because that word implies a different thing, right? And so even though Sterling is almost 1,300 people as a village, you know, the town of Milk River is now around 850 people <laughs> and they're keeping town. So it, it really just comes down to branding and preference. We've debated it, you know, perhaps future councils will make that change, but there's really no tangible benefits. So we you were just- You don't need a bigger council for a town? Nope, again, it, we could change our bylaws and add more councils if you want. Our council is five, so four plus the mayor, and the mayor is actually appointed by council. So council is, ele is elected as a whole and then our, our custom is the person with the most votes becomes mayor, but council gets to make that decision every year during our organizational meeting. So I have to reapply for my job every 12 months, <laughs> which, you know, there's some accountability there. But yeah, there's really no difference, no tactical advantage. It's more about brand and image. Thank you. Great question. Hello, my name is Knut Peterson. Uh, congratulations on being uh, biggest village in Alberta, because those are bragging rights that you c wouldn't have if you were a town. There you go. There's the reason right there. Uh, just a clarification, I, I forgot the, the box, the uh, suggestion box. I forgot it at home, so that doesn't mean you can't make suggestions, but I forgot the box. Uh, my question, Trevor relates to solar panels, the move with the sun, and the efficiency of solar panels, which is an important factor. The colder it is, the more efficient they are, which means that in the wintertime, you can actually generate a lot of power if the sun hits those solar panels at the right angle. So my question to you is like, can you fill us in a little bit about those efficiencies? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple of things to unpack in there. Uh, there are these technologies called tracking systems. Uh, and if you go near Vauxhall, so just north of Vauxhall and then just sort of south and east, there are two sites, each are about 25 acres, that actually have those trackers. So if you drive by at the right time of day, you'll actually see the panels moving uh, to follow the sun. So they start on this side in the mornings, and then they rotate literally through the day to follow the sun. If you, if you look, so you, there's the Alberta Electrical System Operator, or ISO, you can actually go online and you can see real-time generation of any site in the province, including gas-fired, at any time. And if you look at most solar sites first thing in the morning, it's very low. So if, if a site's rated for 20 megawatts, they'll start at two, then it's three. You know, like it's this gradual curve as the sun reaches its zenith and you capture the most energy. The tracking sites, like the one at Hull, it's rated for 25 megawatts. By 7.15 in the morning, it's at 24 because the panels are optimized to capture the sun. The, so they are way more efficient, there is more energy production. The downside, especially on a utility scale, is you now need motors, drives, shafts, control systems, software, technology. My philosophy is if it moves, it can break. 
right? The solar panels on my roof, barring the mother of all hailstorms, there's very little that can go wrong there. And they are warranted for hail damage, by the way. That's not normally an issue. So I think a lot of these companies, you'll see that most utility scale projects are fixed tilt, they're in one position, because most companies have done the calculation that the incremental capital cost of all of that other stuff is far more than, you, than the payback you would get from the gains. But it depends on location, depends on the application. Uh, what we're seeing now is, uh, like the modules on my house are a 350 watt panel. Most panels today are 550 or 600. So even though it's the same panel size, the technology has improved significantly, almost doubling what you can capture. There's also a, tech, a technology called bifacial panels. So the panels on my roof, the sun hits them, the energy passes through, it collects the electricity. You can actually get panels where the sun passes through, hits the snow on the ground, and bounces back and it captures the same energy a second time on the second pass. It's not quite double because of course there's loss. So again, I haven't seen the math, but I'm guessing that between bifacial and some of those optimized panels, that may be almost the same as if you had a tracker. But again, it, it just depends. But it's, it's usually because of the cost and the complexity. Because uh, when that stuff breaks, you know, how much of your system is down, how, especially if you're out by Vauxhall, where's the service technician from? What parts do they need? OPS, it's minus 380 degrees with the wind chill. Like, you know, what does that whole experience look like? I think is, is a big part of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks very much. You're preaching to the converted. I've had panels for about 11 years. Okay. And my first go around, it had to be signed off by the mayor of the city. <laughs> now you can do it through the city manager, which is a little easier. So you just mentioned one change in technology, and there's another one coming with the, the peroscovites, which will be a layer that'll pick up the blue and green and take the panels from 22 to about 30%. So that makes it nice. Um, for, uh, so have you thought about things like that at Sterling uh, to upgrading to the new panels? What do you do with the snow and dirt on the panels? <laughs> yeah, there, there. So, the, to the first point, there are a number of new technologies. Um, there are, are clear panels that look like glass, and so there's a movement to replace windows with solar panels that can harvest energy. And if I, you know, as I look across the atrium here and I see the beautiful sunshine coming in the back there, that could be something that would work very, very well on this building. I'm not sure on the cost of those, and it's not something we've actively explored. Like I said earlier, we will probably lag, not lead. We'll wait for, we'll wait to see that installed. There's other solar technologies where you can actually mount the panels on the side of a building, and they actually blend right into the, like the, the corrugated metal surface can become panels. And they're almost like stick-on, so they're much more, much more cheap to install and maintain. Again, I think there's, there's going to be advances in technologies uh, like that. I'm fortunately married to a mechanical engineer who's very keen on renewables and is installing those things on her business. So I have a bit of a laboratory to watch what happens. The solar preheat, you know, was a bit of a new new venture for us. So I, I agree, we need to keep up on the technology. It's only going to get better, and there will be new applications and new things that we can do. So we will we will continue to explore that. I think. And what was the second part? Sorry. Cleaning. Oh, the cleaning. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, that, that, is, that is the downside, right? So uh, in case you hadn't noticed over the last couple of months, it does snow in southern Alberta. And there are times when I have solar panels at home. My house is also electrically net zero. There were times when I was making exactly none because the snow is covering every panel everywhere. I am not going up there. I'm, not, I'm incredibly lazy. That is not happening, right? I'm going to wait for Mother Nature to do her thing. So we, we do lose some there. Same thing with the village. Even that ground mount array does get snow accumulation. Generally, they're big enough and at an angle enough that it just slides off. Our system was designed to account for snow and, and degradation that happens in the summer. We don't wash them. We don't do anything with snow or dirt or dust. 
you can, but we, the, you know, we built that into the model. Uh, the other consideration in this particular case is it's technically classified as a power plant. So t for me to open that gate and send someone in, they should be a journeyman electrician uh, under the regulations, right? So it's not a function of sending in the 15 an hour summer student, you know, public works parks employee to go wash the panels. That's a no, no, because we don't want anybody getting injured. Um, so at what point does that labor of a journeyman electrician at probably three times that rate, do we actually get any benefit? So we've chosen, it's just part of the math and we, we accept that loss as it is what it is. But there are some self-cleaning technologies, there's some robotic cleaning devices that scoot along the rails. We've just not gone there. Great question though. Hi, my name is Tom Moffat, and uh, congratulations, Trevor, on being able to build uh, all that uh, efficiency for the village of Sterling. That's great. Um, I was wondering if you had ever considered adding some um, battery storage or other types of storage to your solar systems, and if so, if you had thought about the uh, ca new capabilities of uh, vehicle to grid for electric vehicles uh, that maybe, say, maybe an electric fire truck. <laughs> You've clearly been talking to my fire chief. Stop that. <laughs> so there are things like electric fire trucks. Uh, the city of Vancouver, I believe, is going to be the first to deploy. It's significantly more expensive than a traditional fire truck. So it is, again, something we would wait to see what that looks like. I'm a little bit concerned about the service aspect of that, because if there's a failure, where's the next closest qualified technician coming from? So we'll, we'll see how that evolves. But certainly, I think that's a, a thing we can look to in the future. Uh, you know, ba vehicle, electric vehicles as a battery storage for your home is something that's being explored in a number of markets. We have looked at battery storage. The challenge right now is that battery storage is prohibitively expensive. I personally, it's just Trevor's opinion, I think we're about three years away from where the cost of the battery actually makes some sense. Where battery is really helpful is when there's what's called TOD charging or time of day. So if you're in Ontario and you go to you use your dishwasher and your washing machine at 6 p.m. at that peak hour, you actually pay a higher price for electricity consumed in that hour, right? Versus if you want to do laundry at 2 a.m., it's actually much cheaper to do that. So now a battery makes some sense because just as we're doing price arbitrage with summer versus winter, you can generate and store your electricity when it's really expensive during the day, and then you, sorry, you can, you can generate it when it's really cheap, you use it to, to your heart's content, and then you lock the kids in the basement, don't let them touch any devices, and you, you, know, you, you release the battery to the grid and sell it when the prices are really high. That's, that's when a battery really has payback, is when there's a, a, a benefit based on time of day. Alberta's contract pricing, our current market structure, is that, that that's, you pay the same price all the time, every time. So I think that needs to change, and I think that's coming. That's one of the ways utilities are gonna manage future consumption. It's one of the ways they're gonna, like, it's only a matter of time before that comes to Alberta, like that's going to happen, and then a battery will be all over it. And I think again, as the technology improves and gets cheaper, uh, we did look at a Tesla wall as an as an example. Um, I think it was the fire hall we looked at, but each each unit was between seven nine thousand dollars installed at the time, and the incremental benefit of what we could sell power for or use, it just didn't pay for the unit. But I th I think we're like I said, three years away. Good question. Thank you, Trevor. Barb Phillips, excellent presentation. It makes me, uh, Southern Alberta is really shaking it up here. I, I didn't know about Sterling. So anyway, my question is kind of related to Sterling, and, but what's the matter with Lethbridge? How come you guys led so now we could uh, maybe do something here? Because I think you have economic development. It seems to make sense for <laughs> Lethbridge. <laughs> Let me just get the business, the other business card out of my other pocket. Thanks for, thanks for that question and the point. Um, 
Yeah, I, like I said, I, the city of Lethbridge is moving in that direction. So just as we've passed a SEEP bylaw, Clean Energy Inf Improvement Program, the city of Lethbridge has done the same. The city of Lethbridge has done some preliminary investigations on solar for their buildings. So it, if you're not familiar, the city of Lethbridge does have a corporate sustainability strategy. Amandi Parker is the corporate sustainability manager for the corporation. There are a number of things they're doing and tracking. In fact, their report to council was two or three weeks ago, so there's actually an annual report that shows the 31 things they're doing around sustainability. The challenge, I think, for the city, and it, it, it's sort of just in how they're built, they're also the electrical utility. So it's an inherent conflict that's built into the city because one, one arm says, hey, do sustainability, do this, we're happy to help you, here's your permit. The other arm actually has to operate that infrastructure. And solar is not risk-free for the electrical company. So transformers, most of, the, most of the physical assets in the city were deployed in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, before microgeneration was a thing, meaning they're intended to be unidirectional, right? Power comes from the grid through the transformer, to your house. With solar microgeneration, that still has to happen, but now increasingly there's more and more power going the other way. And a lot of the switch gear and a lot of the transformers were never designed for that application in Lethbridge. So the utility knows that. Uh, if you're doing microgeneration, so that's something on your house, right? That's no problem, that's guaranteed by provincial law. If it's a bigger commercial installation or institutional, which this ground mount would be potentially, the city's actually put a policy in place limiting the microgeneration potential to 80% of the transformer's capacity until they better understand what the risks are and what they need to do. As those transformer assets get replaced, and of course they get replaced on a regular basis at end of life cycle, that, that eliminates a lot of that. So I think the city is being far more cautious because they own the infrastructure. My philosophy in Sterling is that's Fortis' problem. But it's easy for me to say that because they have to deal with it because it's the law. I just send it their way. The city has to do that and kind of balance both sides of the house. And so I think that's, they're being prudent. It's your tax dollars that fund both sides of the house. And they don't want this side of the house to do something like blow up this side. And so they're just trying to reconcile that. But certainly renewable energy investment is a big part of what we do. The wind farms, the solar farms, I mean, the, the wind turbine technician program at Lethbridge College is a perfect example. We're absolutely working to develop that industry here. But in terms of the city itself, they're just being very, very cautious and kind of working through that step by step. Bev Mental Atherstone, thank you, Trevor. That's so exciting. We lived in Sterling and now to see it just booming into the into the next decade. It's Very just... Very small B on that boom. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Pollen is another problem on solar panels. Mm -hmm. um, but the snow, Henning and I take care of that with our snow rake. It's ground mount, it's not roof. Ours is ground. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't go up to fall off the roof. <laughs> um, in, Henning mentioned we're in our 10th year of our solar panels. Now, the price of the panels that the panels to give us the same amount of production as we have would be half the price yeah. and we'd get twice the power. So the bang for our buck that we invested at that time would be a ratio of one to four, four to one. Um, you talked about batteries. I wondered if Sterling, with all of its land and space, has thought, has thought instead of having batteries, of having water columns, where during peak time, you pump the water up into the columns, and then during low time, you bring the water down and that, and with the generators, and then you've, you've got your electricity back. <coughs> and now my question, <laughs> um, do you envisage that the city of Lethbridge will tax solar panels on houses as part of property tax. Well, that's a fun question. Uh, why don't we start at the back end and work forwards? So the short answer is your property taxes are based on the assessed value of your property. Any modification that you make to your home that adds to the assessed value does increase your property taxes. Now, What's the solar panel worth? What's the value of that? How does it change the aspect of your home? It's, it's the same thing as landscaping. Technically, your landscaping is not taxable. 
can't tax, you can't tax your yard. You can only tax your building, right? But if you have a ridiculous amount of landscaping and it looks great, the, as the assessor whips by or uses Google to search and goes, hmm, that enhances the value of your property, that does become taxable indirectly. And so I think solar is much the same way. Uh, I think at some point, the province is probably going to have to tweak how municipalities calculate taxes. There's going to be some discussion around what does that look like, I think. Um, in terms of water column, and there, there are, so there's water column, there's gravity storage, there's molten salt is another one that's very similar where you heat the salt up to store the energy and then deplete it. Again, I think for sterling, those are all really cool and interesting. And if I can keep my wife away from those trade shows long enough, we'll be all right. Because <laughs> um, she loves that sort of stuff. I, again, I think we will lag, not lead. If we see that deployed and used in industry, and there's, there's a few examples around North America where it's being used successfully, you know, how do we convert that to municipal use? Again, I, I th I'd like to go there eventually, but these are public dollars. We, we can't be taking risks until we know there's a payback. Like, we will not make an investment like that until we know what the return is, and I, I just don't think those technologies are proven at this point. So it's, it's time, but yeah, I think we're open to, if it, if it makes money, it makes sense, we'll try anything. Quick question. So my name is Mark Gettle. And we're talking about efficiencies and savings, and then you were saying that it, the uh, distribution fee is variable, so every kilowatt you're using in your home, you're not uh, paying for the dis distribution. And before I go on, is there anybody here from Revenue Canada? <laughs> okay. If not, then I'll talk about GST. <laughs> every kilowatt hour you're using at home, you're not paying GST. Now, the way my bill, if I remember correctly, is when I get my bill, I get how much I import it, how much it costs, the distribution fee, the, the town, yes, what, the all franchise fee, all that is there, that's the total. Then they subtract the amount that I sent out, and then I pay the GSD. So I don't pay GSD on the distribution and all that stuff. So that's another huge saving yep. on, on that. So that's why I hope that the Revenue Canada doesn't uh, look at that and see that we're basically not paying GST on the distribution costs that we imported. Right. So again, it's a net saving. Gotcha. Okay. They'll watch it on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we can edit that part out, right? <laughs> Colleen Quintel, my cost, Trevor, is around the initial startup. So you said in 2017 there was the government of the day had grants available, but um, how much of your startup costs, like to pay for this big field, um, was covered by grants? How much did the village have to come up with? And how long will it take you to recoup if it cost you anything? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, our total system deployment in 2017 was about $585,000. That was the total gross cost. And at that time, the provincial government of the day had uh, about a 30% incentive program. And it, I say about because in, on some of the installs, we got like 32 and some of them we got 28. It just depended on the details. So about a third of that cost was actually covered by provincial grants. So the out-of-pocket cost for sterling was about $400,000. And so the quick math on that, I told you about our $40,000 savings. That's roughly a 10-year payback. Right Now, when I came from the corporate sector, no company would make a capital investment that had a 10-year payback. That is way too slow. Right? Most companies are looking for three, maybe four, maybe five-year paybacks for capital improvements. But as a municipality, we can afford to be a bit more patient. And I, I think you know, the public's expecting slightly less of a payback from us. So to me, it still makes sense. Uh, you know, to Bev's earlier point, panels have doubled what they can capture, and the prices have dropped by between 30 and 50%. So our deployment today would probably only cost around $300,000, even if there's no grant, you know, government grant funding. It still would still be cheaper to do it today because the costs have fallen, and it would likely generate more power. So our 10-year payback today is probably closer to five or six years if we were to redo the whole system over. So again, for me as a municipality, I think that's a prudent payback and a, and a pretty good return on investment. <coughs> Hi, Trevor. <coughs> Knut Peterson again. Uh, Trevor, I just wanted to ask you about the regulated 
electricity market in in Alberta <laughs> <laughs> compared to uh, to the free market that we have now. I know it caused a lot of trouble back in the days when I think it was Premier Klein uh, made it open, and uh, I just wonder how that's playing out with you, pros and cons, particularly related to solar. Okay. <coughs> yeah, so that's probably a half an hour presentation in and of itself, and I'm happy to come back and do that for you. Um, there's lots of debate about Alberta's deregulated market, but let me put on my hat as an economic developer. So. In April, we will be hosting probably 30 or so companies from Denmark who are in the renewable energy space. The only province in Canada they're interested in looking at is Alberta. And the only place they want to talk to is Alberta because of our deregulated market. It's the only place where it makes sense for that heavy utility scale investment because you can sign PPAs or power purchase agreements because we have this deregulated market that inspires competition. Now. It is also very painful for us as consumers when there's a blip in the system. Like I said, the current government has imposed a price cap of 13.5 cents per kilowatt hour. That's not really a price cap, just as the previous government did a similar thing. The, 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 the benefit of the deregulated market is you have options. So like I said, Ridge Utilities today, if you sign up with us, the lowest rate I can offer you is 10.15 cents. So you can already get a better rate than the regulated rate just by changing providers. If you get off the default rate, you can save money today. It's that simple. The only reason you have that option is because we have a competitive market and there are competitive sources out there. But you will still have to pay for the power we use. And even if the government puts in a price cap or a subsidy or some other thing, the generators are still going to get paid. It costs what it costs to make that power. And relative to the rest of North America, California being the most prominent example, looking to Europe, our power rates are actually not that bad. Don't, don't throw any food, you've all finished eating, right? Relatively speaking, our market is still pretty inexpensive by comparison. So because of that competitive nature, we, there's been some other things that have, been hap have happened here. And more of the risk, in my opinion, has been put onto those companies. So there's an interesting thing in Alberta in that the generators are guaranteed their revenue. So I actually have to pay a prudential as Ridge Utilities. I prepay what I think my customers are going to use next month because if any customer defaults, the generator, the utility, must get paid the full amount. So think about that at scale across the whole province. We're talking billions of dollars, right? But future capital investment, the need to add capacity, the, the market is more, you know, the private sector is able to respond to that much more quickly. We've seen investments in Alberta that I don't think a government regulated unit provincial monster like, you know, hydro in, in Ontario, and, and we've seen the example in Ontario, it's a total train wreck, right? The market in Ontario is a disaster because it was all very centralized and the planners didn't do a very good job of that. I do personally believe as a private sector guy, that the private sector is better positioned to make those adjustments and make those capital investments, but I'm not suggesting for a second the market is perfect. The other regulatory change that's happened very, very recently is the government has allowed more community scale generation. So micro generation rules are changing. So we were, for example, capped. We could only produce as much solar as we consumed. So to be, you can get to net zero, you can, but you could only install as much solar as the total power you used. That's changing in that we'll be able to add more panels and actually be a net generator. Right? So that means more revenue potential for us, and we can literally fill in the gaps and add some more panels. That's a very recent change, and I think you'll see more of those changes as, as the regulatory environment gets smarter. Ms. Sarah. We have time for one quick question and one quick answer. Right. <laughs> I will stick around if you want to join your... Dang, I had a long question, but hi, Trevor, fabulous presentation, thank you so much. My name is Sarah Amies and I'm here today representing the Downtown Business Revitalization Zone. And one of the things that I've thought of <clears throat> was I would love to see solar panels on all of those flat roofs on, in the downtown. And while I was doing a tiny bit of research in prep for your, your presentation today, I came across the net zero challenge that is um, being administered through the federal government. And I'm wondering 
wondering if you know anything about that and can you answer that question in the amount of time this lady will allow us to have. <laughs> Thank you. The short answer is no. And I'm done. No, I, I don't know much about that program, but I, all I will say is that for businesses looking to make those investments, it's not necessarily capital out of pocket. There are solar developers that will finance those things, and they will take all the revenue and all the carbon offsets, and once that's paid, then they hand that back to you. So it, e even if there's no government grants, there are market mechanisms where solar still has a payback and may make some sense, but let's, let's chat after, and you, you, we can definitely talk. Yeah. Thank you. How's that? <laughs> that was perfect. Thank you. I want to thank Trevor uh, for his presentation and the question and answers. Trevor, I, ha I have one last thing for you. Do you have a takeaway for us um, as viewers that have watched your presentation? Do you have a takeaway for us that we can take home? It's not that hard. <laughs> right? Uh, well, so whether you agree or disagree on you know, the UN SDGs, whether you agree or disagree on carbon emissions, whether you agree or disagree on climate emergency, fundamentally, I believe we could and should do better. As human beings, we should lessen our footprint on the, on the earth, no matter what that looks like, right? We're still gonna do damage, There's, like, I still eat steaks, there's still stuff that's gonna, I drive a truck, you know, but we can and we should do better. And it's not that hard. It's all simple, small stuff, whether it's recycling the stuff in your kitchen, whether it's turning light switches off, or whether it's exploring solar. It, there are examples, there are best practices, there are resources. Just let's do what we can do. Thank you, Trevor, for your presentation, and hopefully we'll see you all next week. Question